On this edition of Veterans Health Watch, we'll learn what stress does to the body and what you can do about it. We'll also learn what the VA Maryland Healthcare System is doing to help veterans cope with post-traumatic stress disorder. So please join us. Welcome to Veterans Health Watch, a program sponsored by the Veterans Affairs Maryland Healthcare System that provides the latest health and benefits information for Maryland's veterans, their family members, and the local community. I'm Kenya Griffin. When it comes to heart disease, do you know the things you should do to keep your heart in top shape? Joining us to tell us about his research and his prescription for heart health is Dr. Michael Miller, a cardiologist for the VA Maryland Healthcare System and the director for the Center for Preventative Cardiology at the University of Maryland Medical System. So thank you so much for joining us. Great to be here, Kenya. Let's start with some statistics. How common is heart disease? Well, Kenya, heart disease is and will remain the number one killer in the United States, number one killer among veterans as well. Um, there are somewhere between 10 to 15 million Americans that have heart disease and probably another 10 times that amount that are at risk for heart disease. The major risk factors being high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, and diabetes. And yeah, these are things you hear about all the time, as it, like you said, with our population. And we know with modern medicine, we have surgery, we have medicine um, to, to help address the issues once they've happened. But I understand you're more focused on preventative care and behavioral car cardiology. Could you explain that for us a little more? Well, yeah, Kenya, because it, as it turns out, if we can modify some of our behaviors, then we, in a lot of situations, can prevent heart disease. And, you know, we talk about the genetics and some people believe that if their parents have bad genes for heart disease, that they automatically are going to develop heart disease. But that's not really the mm -hmm. case. It turns out that by and large, most cases of heart disease are largely preventable. And so we've already talked about the four main risk factors, but the one hidden risk factor which is where behavioral cardiology comes into play. The one major risk factor for heart disease is stress. Stress, that's, that's a big word nowadays. I mean, everybody's yeah. talking about stress and how to manage it. So, so what are some of the basic life changes or lifestyle changes that we can make to address this issue? Well, it's so key, Kenya, because we all have stress, right? But it's really how we deal with it that can make the difference between a heart attack, stroke, life and death so to speak. And so uh, what we've come to appreciate is really learning ways to manage stress. Number one is we shouldn't be so hard on ourselves. That is so important because all too often we uh, just, you know, want to be perfect and we want to walk the walk and, uh, and don't take ourselves uh, super seriously and if we could kind of relax a little bit chill out and stay away from two of those really important factors that could promote heart disease and that is anger and hostility being angry and being hostile can lead to the inner parts of our body stress and that could promote heart disease. Well, let's get into that a little bit more. When you say the inner, inner part of our body, what actually happens to our bodies when we are angry and stressful and not chilling out? Right, and, and so the way, Kenya, that I like to think about it is how we physically look sometimes can in a way tell us what's going on in our body. Okay. So for example, when we clench our fists, you know, when you're angry, you clench your fists and you get real stiff, What's really going on in our body is you're stiffening up your blood vessels. And when you stiffen up your blood vessels, your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up. 
And, you know, if it happens every once in a blue moon, not a big deal. But if it's happening day in and day out, just think about it. You're actually causing premature aging of our blood vessels. And what happens is when you have stiff blood vessels, not only do you have high blood pressure, but also it leads to the development of cholesterol plaques getting in. So being real tight all the time is really a bad, it's a warning signal that our body is really getting eaten up alive, so to speak. Well, what about those people who say, I don't get angry, I, I don't, I, I'm, I don't, I'm a nice person, I don't really get angry at anyone, but they, they do experience a lot of stress, so they're not managing the stress. What happens with their bodies during stress that could contribute to heart disease or heart issues? Right, so if they're ex expressively looking okay, but internally mm -hmm. feeling all stressed out, they may not show it by clenching their fists, but you could see in the look in their eyes, for example, that they're stressed out. They're probably undergoing a similar pattern. Okay. Again, you know, it's okay to be under stress for specific situations. Like I like to tell my students, you're studying for a test. You want to be a little bit more uh, under stress because that keeps you activated, you're right? You become more alert and you mm -hmm. can do a little bit better. But again, what we're talking about is day in and day out yeah. stress. That's a problem. And I've under I understand you've done some exciting research on this topic. Can you share with us some of your findings? Sure. So we did um, a studies uh, here uh, as, and the university, and, and basically we asked the question that we know that uh, things that cause stress cause your blood vessels to close up or constrict. So we took the opposite approach, and we had our volunteers watch movies or you know specific segments of Saturday Night Live, for example, uh, and it was designed to make them laugh. And we found that when people laughed enough to bring tears in their eyes, that their blood vessels opened up, they dilated. So if you think about it, dilated, opened up blood vessels, yeah. more blood flow, mm -hmm. but it also means that good chemicals are being produced that could reduce your risk of heart disease. Now does it have to be, do you have to have a tear jerking laugh to experience these positive symptoms or could it just be good laughter on a regular basis? Yeah, I would say a good laugh, uh, the laugh that we all experience mm -hmm. that makes us feel very relaxed because when you feel very relaxed, that means these protective chemicals are coming out, being released and, um, and that's the end result. If you feel relaxed, you may have tears uh, coming down your eyes, but it's a feeling of well-being. Great, great. Well, Dr. Miller, please stay with us. We want to learn more about stress and how we can manage it and how it affects our heart. But we're going to take a short break, but please stay tuned. We're going to learn more about this subject. The Telephone Care Line is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you've got a question about medication, diabetes, your, di your diagnosis, any concerns, you can always give us a call. People want to hear a live voice and not the machine. We're always there to answer your questions. Give us a call. 800-865-2441 and press 1 to speak to a nurse. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. A nurse is happy to help you. Welcome back to Veterans Health Watch. Today we're learning about how stress affects the heart and joining us is Dr. Michael Miller, a cardiologist. Dr. Miller, let's reiterate what happens to the body when we experience stress. Sure, so ju just think of it as when you're sitting in traffic and you're, you get real stiff and tight and you can't really do a whole lot. So what happens in the body is that you build up plaque, you build up cholesterol plaque because some of the cells there get crowded in a way to, 
to collect that plaque. And over time, what happens is there could be as much as a 20-year difference between our age and our blood vessel age. So there are some people who may look 40 or 50 years old, but their blood vessels are 70 years old. That's not good. No. And conversely, if you manage stress well and you, you know, do a little bit of chilling here and there and um, really feel pretty good on a regular basis, you could have just the opposite. You could look 70, but have blood vessels of a 40 year old or a 50 year old. So let's get into that a little bit more because we all experience stress every day. That For that person stuck in traffic, they have to get to work, they have to go every day, and the commute is probably horrible. What can we do to address the stress and to help to re reduce the effects of it? Right, so we live in a stressful world. On the way to work or wherever you're going, especially if you're hitting traffic, then you need to do what makes you relax. So some people might listen to tapes they, uh, you know, on relaxation, or you can listen to music, which is one of, I think, the best ways to relieve stress. And with music, it's really something that you enjoy. Mm -hmm. So you find the music or the, find the channel that brings you music that kind of gives you enjoyment. And one of the tricks here is the kind of music that brings chills down your spine. That is the real effect. If you get the chills down your spine music, and we've all had mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. uh, that releases a chemical from the brain that also uh, helps to keep our blood vessels young. Let's, uh, when you say releases the chemicals from the brain, so now we want to talk about what happens to your body when you, when you take those, those steps to reduce your stress. And I love the find what works for you, what makes you feel happy. So what happens to our bodies when we find those things and that, that music, the right song comes on? Yeah, so what happens here, you're releasing a, the chemical known as dopamine. And that chemical really has a great effect on our body to kind of, uh, if you will, help to unlock some of the stressors, uh, that blood pressure effect, uh, the heart rate effect, uh, the likelihood of causing an abnormal heart rhythm can be influenced by using some of these relaxation techniques. Mm -hmm. Some people use meditation to help relax. We've already talked a little bit about laughing and music. Hugging is another way to release or releases the chemical oxytocin. And what we've learned from studies that have been conducted over the course of the last uh, five to 10 years is that this chemical could actually help to regenerate, if you will, bring back to life heart cells that have been damaged. So in a way, you could take a broken heart and fix it um, by helping to release these chemicals in the body. And how often, I have a two-part question, how often should we practice these stress-relieving techniques and how, how long do the effects last? Right, so emotions, to affect our emotions either through laughter or music, hugging is easy. You know, you hug uh, your a loved one when you're leaving in the morning. Uh, if you don't have anybody living with you, or if you have a pet, hug a pet. And if you don't have that, hug a pillow, because you can still get a response by doing by just hugging something. Uh, so doing that at least once, if not twice a day, listening to your favorite music two, three times a week, getting a good laugh at least once a week. So you're really getting those emotional vibes mm -hmm. up there and really helping to, again, keep your vessels young at heart. So even if you can't change your situation that might cause the stress, if you learn how to manage it, you can change your, your response to, to the stress. Absolutely, you can change your response. And, and again, small changes make a big difference. We talked about emotions, but the big picture also includes nutrition Okay. and it also includes activity. Yeah. We still can't forget those things. Yeah. We can't forget, and, yeah. and, and there are tricks to the, to the trade mm -hmm. too. So I tell my patients, for example, um, to take a half of a teaspoon of cinnamon and put it in their morning coffee. And cinnamon has great effects. It could affect mood, but it also could affect your blood glucose levels if you're at risk of diabetes. Okay. So just a half a teaspoon in your coffee um, or tea can make a difference. And what about the effects? How long do the effects last when you're talking about the laughter? You had that great belly laugh this morning. Uh, uh, amazingly, the effects can last up to 24 hours. 
So uh, it's pretty remarkable yeah. what our bodies are intended and what mm -hmm. they can do. Uh, and many of us believe that practicing these kinds of activities on a regular basis may help to get us off a medication or two if the reason we're on the medication is due to stress. Yeah. And again, we, we're talking about preventative care, so we want to we want to address the situation before it gets out of hand. Kenya, it's all about prevention. Yeah, yeah. It's all about prevention. And tell us more about some of the foods we could use. Yeah, so there are lots of foods, and I wrote a book called Heal Your Heart that lists the top 50 foods based on research that not only could help our cholesterol and our glucose and our blood pressure, but also improve our mood. Because if our mood is improved, then we're less likely to feel depressed, less likely to feel angry, and keep our blood vessels young. So these are pretty simple tasks that we can, we can undertake, and like you said, just a little bit at a time, something every day. So what would you say is your overall prescription for a healthy heart? Well, my overall prescription is to, real, to really abide by the nutritional aspects uh, and some of the foods we've already talked about, you could look at and figure out those 50 foods. A lot of them are, are uh, they're all heart healthy. Uh, activity, you don't have to run marathons. Walking briskly, and you could time it by going on a treadmill. And the so-called sweet spot is just about three miles an hour. It's about 20 minute a mile. So unless you have really debilitating hip or knee problems, most of us could walk three miles an hour. And if you could do that 30 minutes uh, a day or so, then you're getting the benefits of activity. Of course, yeah. if you like other activities, whether it's swimming, uh, biking, whatever activities you like, just That's, find something you like. That, yeah, I was gonna say, and I would think finding something you like to do helps you to maintain whatever that activity is. You can stay consistent. If you like to walk, you walk. For sure. Yeah, yeah. So don't, I mean, if, don't do things, one of my patients, said um, that she just got to the point where she just uh, is doing things she wants to do. Right. And so f figure out what you enjoy doing, what foods you'd like to eat that are healthy, that improve mood, and it's a really a good prescription. Yeah, well thank you so much for joining us. Is there anything else you would like to add before we go? Well, I, I think that we really have a major control over our own health. And the good news is, is that uh, these small changes can really produce big dividends on our hearts. Well, thank you again, Dr. Miller, for joining us. I enjoy a good laugh, so uh, I'll start with those changes. Beautiful, thank you. We're gonna take a short break, but when we return, we'll learn about post-traumatic stress disorder and what services the VA offers to help those veterans living with this disorder. Please join us. Have you heard that the Baltimore VA Medical Center parking garage is under construction? Where will you park? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Let's go. In late February, we'll start relocating parking to the Metro West parking garage, just two blocks from the VA Medical Center. From the VA garage on Green Street, you can get into the temporary parking site in just four easy turns. Just look for signs like this. Once there, you'll see familiar parking attendants who will ask for your VA identification card or your appointment slip before granting you access. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, ma'am. The Metro West garage will be open 24 hours a day and will be patrolled by VA police and security. After you park your car, you can wait for a shuttle in this warm and dry shelter. All shuttles are wheelchair accessible, free of charge, and will drop you off under the breezeway of the medical center and pick you up again after your appointment. You don't need reservations to ride the shuttle. If it's a nice day and you decide to walk just two blocks to the medical center, you can pick up a pedestrian map like this. And if you have questions about parking and valet service, there are lots of ways to get information. You can go to our website or you can go to the information desk inside of the medical center or you can call 410-605-7103. We know your time is valuable, so we ask that you arrive at least 30 minutes earlier for your clinic appointments during this time. And we appreciate your patience as we work to make repairs to the garage for your safety. We're looking forward to the reopening of the Baltimore VA Medical Center garage. Welcome back to Veterans Health Watch. 
We would all like to reduce the stress in our lives, but for some veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder, that need is urgent. Thankfully, the VA understands that need and has professionals who can help these veterans. Joining us is Dr. Aaron Romero, the director for the Trauma Recovery Program at the VA Maryland Healthcare System. Dr. Romero, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me today. Dr. Romero, we hear a lot about post-traumatic mm -hmm. stress disorder or PTSD when it comes to veterans, but there's still some mystery involved in what this disorder is all about. Can you tell us more about it and why are veterans more likely to have it? Sure, so post-traumatic stress disorder develops um, after someone experiences a traumatic event or a life-threatening event, and that can range from anything from a motor vehicle accident, rape, um, a sexual assault, or combat. Um, after, you know, most people actually will experience a traumatic event in their lifetime. Um, not everyone goes on to develop PTSD. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder develops after, over time, if someone is struggling with a set of symptoms. Um, just briefly, those symptoms are remembering the event in an intrusive way, the, the, the memory keeps coming up for them. Um, also, avoidance, avoiding um, memories or safe reminders of, of the traumatic event, as well as we find that people with PTSD have unhelpful changes in their thinking and mood, and um, a, a body response too, where they feel like keyed up and on edge. And this is, you go into the disorder when a certain amount of time has passed and you're still experiencing these symptoms based on the traumatic event? Yes, what we find is that after experiencing a traumatic event, most people will experience some of the symptoms I just mentioned. Um, but over time, when at least a month has passed, but, but usually if it's been about three or six months and the symptoms haven't come down and they're interfering mm -hmm. with um, people's abilities to, to do the things that they enjoy in their life, that that's, that's when um, it, someone would be classified as maybe having PTSD. And how common is PTSD? Um, it, um, in the United States, about 7% of Americans will, over their lifetime, um, have a diagnosis of PTSD. We know that when we look at combat veterans, the, the numbers range, but they go up to as high as 39% of, of combat veterans who will experience PTSD. And we know with, our, with the Vietnam veterans, the baby boomers, some mm -hmm. of them are now retiring, and we've heard that the symptoms are more noticeable now. Yeah, sometimes okay. we're seeing some of the veterans who work was a way of maybe avoiding mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe overworked or kind of were able to manage their symptoms. Um, and then when they're retired, the memories might come up more. And also some of the recent conflicts in the news um, about the current wars can bring up reminders. So, you know, we really still see um, veterans from all different eras of and, war. And you mentioned some of the symptoms. Can you mm -hmm. give us a go into a little more detail about the symptoms one would see with post-traumatic stress disorder. Sure. So the first symptom um, is, we call them intrus intrusions or intrusive symptoms, and it's where um, someone will re-experience the event, um, where they, they don't, it's kind of like unwanted memories. Um, they might come up in the form of nightmares about the event. Um, it might also come up just out of the blue. Um, there's also a physiological body response where um, their, their body will feel um, maybe physically, their heart might start beating, um, waking up in night sweats. Um, so the, the, that's one of the first symptoms of PTSD, are we experiencing or intrusive symptoms. Uh, a second set of symptoms is avoidance. Um, we find that when someone develops PTSD, kind of a natural human response to pain is to want to push it away. Mm -hmm. And so Oftentimes when someone develops PTSD, it's out of a wanting to try to help themselves push away the pain. They start avoiding safe reminders of the trauma event, and when the memory pops up, try to push it away, and that's, that's another symptom. When you say safe reminders, what do, what do you mean by safe reminders of a traumatic event? Is it more common places that people would normally visit? Mm -hmm. So it, you know, it's all often linked to the actual traumatic event someone experienced with it. So, you know, if we use uh, a motor vehicle accident, um, if someone was driving a vehicle when it happened, they might start avoiding driving. Okay. And the more they avoid it, it actually signals to your brain that driving is dangerous. Every time I drive is dangerous with it. Um, same thing um, with um, what we find like in Iraq, sometimes the IEDs were near trash cans. So when someone comes back here, they feel like the trash cans might signal danger. Okay. And so it's relearned. So when you start avoiding those situations, it doesn't allow for new learning. 
And so avoidance is one of the cardinal symptoms of PTSD. And earlier we learned how mm -hmm. stress affects the body. So mm -hmm. none of this sounds healthy for the heart. I'm sorry, more affects the heart. And none of this sounds healthy for the heart or for your general well-being. So mm -hmm. when should someone seek medical assistance? If they're having the symptoms for you know at least a month, um, but if they've been hanging on for three to six months and they're not getting better, it's unlikely the symptoms will get better without treatment. Um, I always think also if it's interfering with your relationships, your work, just living the life you want to live, that's a really good and important time to come in. Um, the good news is we have really good treatments that can help people feel some relief from these symptoms. Yeah, we want to get into that, the treatment. What are mm -hmm. some of the treatment options? Because we, we want people to know they should not do this alone. If you're experiencing mm -hmm. these symptoms for an extended period of time, please come in for help. And what yeah. are some of the treatment options they'll find here? Well, we use um, evidence-based treatments for PTSD, which just means that there's been a lot of research to show that they, these treatments help. And what they involve is usually about 12 sessions, um, 60 to 90 minutes, and we focus on one of the other symptoms of PTSD, which is unhelpful thinking. Um, we also look at avoidance um, and how can we start approaching safe um, things that, that people really want to, to um, engage in again, and also learning that the memory of the event is not dangerous. And through that treatment, we find is all of these symptoms come down, um, including um, the, the body responses like the headaches and the, the nausea, like the physiological responses, and um, like Dr. Miller talked about, that can, the, the kind of stress reactions that yeah. can come up for anyone um, come down with those treatments. And I've learned from doing this mm -hmm. show, we talk to our veterans who, they walk away with tips and techniques mm -hmm. and things that they can practice on their own, like mm -hmm. you said, to help reduce some of the reactions they experience. Tell us about some of those tips and techniques that veterans have, have found helpful. Yeah. From, from using the program? How do they, how do they use them? So um, we teach like different ways of challenging thinking, um, but also um, we augment our treatment by teaching relaxation techniques, um, mindfulness. We even have a volunteer that comes into our program that teaches our veterans yoga. So really looking at the full um, picture of, of ways to help cope. So yeah. um, teaching a lot of different types of skills. And so if a veteran wanted to seek treatment mm -hmm. and, and more help, what's the first step this veteran or even, even a family member of a veteran should take? Well, the first step is making sure that you're enrolled in um, VA, for VA Maryland Healthcare. So going to, making sure that you're enrolled. For veterans who are enrolled here, if they've been involved in mental health care in the last year, they can always call back the person they were seeing or talk to their current provider about their symptoms. Um, and they can facilitate a referral to our clinic. Okay. Um, for anyone who's new to mental health care um, at the, and enrolled here, they can um, go into our walk-in clinic. We have Monday through Friday at 1230 for mental health care and um, can also contact our office to, to schedule that Great. appointment. Dr. Romero, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for, to you and your team for all you do to help our veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. Thank you for having us up on today. Well, that wraps up today's show. If you have questions about today's topic or would like to make suggestions for future topics, please give us a call or visit our webpage at maryland.va.gov. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And remember, if you know a veteran or if you are a veteran who is not using the VA Maryland Healthcare System, please visit one of our facilities or give us a call. We'd love to serve you. Please join us next time. Volunteering is an opportunity to show your patriotism. Most importantly, it's a good feeling knowing that you're helping those who have already served. And it's always an honor and a privilege to me to be there because I know that I get to help the men and the women who have served us. So if you're interested in volunteering with us, best thing is to get in contact with us through our webpage or you can also call us. It really, really gives me an opportunity to give back. Make a difference.